Hey, it's Cole from E Free. I want to thank you for listening to this message. I pray that as you listen, that you would be blessed by this message and that in the right way that God would challenge you in your walk with Jesus. So enjoy the message. Well, good morning, Genesee OE Free Church family. Good morning. It is great to be with you today. And today marks, as many of you know for me, two very special anniversaries. I began pastoral ministry in 1989, 35 years ago, serving my first church in New York City in Staten Island, where I met the very lovely Cindy Bloom and then gave her a new name. And then my 10th year as your pastor. So for many reasons, I love Palm Sunday. There's the anniversary thing. And then there's the whole last name thing. If you're new here, my last name is Palm. So our family grew up calling this our holiday. But with the greater wisdom that comes from age, I'm not sure that it was a good idea to steal Jesus' big moments. And it, if you're one of those people who love sermon application, I'm going to give you an application point right up front. Don't steal from Jesus. He does not appreciate it. So I hope you know that the focus here is not me, even though I'm celebrating these anniversaries. It's Jesus in his glory. I couldn't imagine a better picture as we all scrambled together in the second row to make sure that the children in the front row all had palms. To see them waving those branches just choked me up. That's what this day is all about. But there's one thing about Palm Sunday that I dread, coming up with a fresh approach. I mean, after three and a half decades of preaching, I've preached on almost everything conceivable, and it's proving difficult. And I was reflecting back on the last number of years in searching for fresh insights. I frequently looked backward in history for those. Between our church in New York and in Sarasota, I've shared some of the following insights, and I've shared them with you as well. Here's a very brief look back. If you're looking for earlier reflections of Palm Sunday, we begin in the Law of Moses. The book of Leviticus describes several feasts of Yahweh, or feasts of the Lord, and one of these was designed to commemorate the 40-year wilderness wanderings of the Israelites. And in Leviticus 23, 40, we read about this feast of tabernacles. And you shall take on the first day the fruit of splendid trees, branches of palm trees and boughs of leafy trees and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. Now, Jewish people call this a lulav. They actually take palm branches and willow and other leafy boughs and put them into this, this little thing you can hold in your hand, and they wave it. And my college, the State University of New York, had a huge Jewish population. And I can still remember seeing Jewish students waving those lulavs and then going behind the residence dorms and seeing the makeshift booths that they had set up in order to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. A few years ago, I shared this one moment from the reign of a wicked king, Jehu. He was appointed by Elisha the prophet in order to supplant the even more wicked family of King Ahab and his horrible wife Jezebel and to depose Ahab's son, Joram, who was now the king. Upon the news that one of Elisha's servants had anointed Jehu king of Israel, Joram's servants Sensing that regime change was coming, did the following. Then in haste, every man of them took his garment and put it under him on the bare steps. And they blew trumpets and proclaimed, Jehu is king. It's hard to miss the foreshadowing of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem as an enthusiastic crowd lined his pathway with garments as well. It is from this story that we learn that that was one of the ways of honoring a king. Now, on several occasions, I've shared a historical moment that describes the entry of a Jewish freedom fighter named Simon the Maccabee. And this is not a biblical reference, but a historical one. 
In the book called 1 Maccabees 1351, we read these words. See if they ring familiar. On the 23rd day of the second month, in the 171st year, translated 141 BC, the Jews entered it with praise and palm branches, and with harps and cymbals and stringed instruments, and with hymns and songs, because a great enemy had been crushed and removed from Israel. That great enemy was actually various Greek overlords that were now located in Syria and were dominating and actually torturing the Jewish people. And this freedom fighter, Simon the Maccabee, not of the tribe of Judah, but this freedom fighter finishes the fight against those Syrian overlords and Jerusalem is set free. And he rode in on a donkey, People waved palm branches, and once again, it's hard not to see a prophetic glimpse of the true king of the proper tribe who would ultimately enter into Jerusalem and receive that hero's welcome. Of course, mo on most Palm Sundays, we focus on the life and ministry of Jesus. And even though our focus will be elsewhere today, I don't want us to miss this moment especially at the heart of the beginning of Holy Week. So turn with me first to John 12, 12 through 19. Now the next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and they went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they had heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, You see, you are gaining nothing. Look, the whole world has gone after him. Now this was Israel's big moment. The king of kings and the lord of lords was in their midst, in the flesh, standing before them, was the Messiah of God. Israel's hope was there. But verse 19 reveals the wicked heart of the Pharisees. As they saw the crowd swell, fed by the enthusiasm of what they had witnessed when Jesus had said to his friend Lazarus from the other side of the tomb, Lazarus, come forth and resurrected his friend, all that these Pharisees could say is look, the whole world has gone after him. While the crowd energetically waved palms and cast garments before Jesus, there were the Pharisees plotting his death. So we've looked at the past, often with a laser beam focus on the gospel accounts. But today we're going to look in an entirely different direction. And I'm going to preach a message that I've never preached before. Well, most of them are that. That's true. We're going to look towards the future. We're going to study a moment in the book of Revelation where a great multitude, much larger than the crowd in Jerusalem, will worship Jesus and they will wave palm branches. This amazing moment is found in the seventh chapter of the book of Revelation. We're going to look at the entire chapter with a special focus on the middle of the chapter where this palm-waving scene plays out in heaven. And I just want to share, in the book of Revelation, we're dealing with a lot of hard-to-understand apocalyptic imagery. So I'm going to do my best today to unpack that, but this is one of those big boy, big girl sermons. So I want to encourage you to strap up your pants and let's dig into the Word of God. Amen? Amen. Let's do this together. The first point that I want to share is that God will seal Jewish witnesses after the witness of the church has been removed. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 7, 1 through 8. 
After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, that no wind might blow on earth or sea or against any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun with the seal of the living God. And he called with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm earth and sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of the sealed. 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. 12,000 from the tribe of Judah were sealed. 12,000 from the tribe of Reuben. 12,000 from the tribe of Gad. 12,000 from the tribe of Asher. 12,000 from the tribe of Naphtali. 12,000 from the tribe of Manasseh. 12,000 from the tribe of Simeon. 12,000 from the tribe of Levi. 12,000 from the tribe of Issachar. 12,000 from the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000 from the tribe of Joseph, 12,000 from the tribe of Benjamin were sealed. Now, the events described in this passage take place in a time frame that is referred to as the Great Tribulation. Now, there is a seven-year tribulation, and the first three and a half years are simply referred to as tribulation, sometimes also as birth pangs. That's a little bit uh, hard to understand. But during this three-and-a-half-year period, the Antichrist, Satan's Messiah counterfeit, is gaining power. He's dazzling the world with his diplomatic achievements. He is gaining the respect of people, unsaved people, people who do not understand what he's all about. Now, by this point, Jesus has raptured his church. And those with spiritual discernment, therefore, are largely gone. And it doesn't take long for the Antichrist to institute a global movement centered around his own narcissistic personality. This is something we see in any cult, right? A personality cult where a dynamic leader is elevated even over the truth. And there is never going to be a more horrible personality cult than the one that that gathers around the Antichrist. Now, the second three and a half year period is the one called the Great Tribulation. This is where the Antichrist has consolidated power. The church is assuredly gone at this point. And this is when the Antichrist begins to show his full hand. It's a time where God is going to pour out great plagues of judgment. But it is also a time where many will come to Christ during this period and they will suffer martyrdom. I think one of the great witnesses will be the rapture itself. Imagine if everybody that you knew who was a Christian, who walked the walk, not just talked the talk, was suddenly gone and all the posers and the hypocrites and the atheists and the agnostics were still here. What a powerful truth. What a powerful come to Jesus moment. And there are many who will come to Christ in this great tribulation, but they will suffer martyrdom, the overwhelming perhaps majority of them. Now before we dig into the 144,000, let me pause for a moment concerning this reference to the four corners of the earth. Now atheists and Bible critics have a field day with this statement. And they call those of us who revere the word of God, you've heard this term before, flat earthers. We're stuck in the past. We're primitives. We have no idea that we're living on a sphere, not a flat map. But the cosmology or understanding of the world, the cosmology of the biblical authors is actually anything but primitive. Consider this statement in the first of all the books written in the Bible. In Job 26, 7, we read, He stretches out the north over the void and hangs the earth on nothing. Now, let's put this statement in historical context. At a time where the Babylonians thought that the earth was held up by two massive marble columns, and the Greeks thought that some demigod named Atlas was carrying the world on his shoulders, 
Job describes the invisible forces that fix the earth in its orbit. This same author described a circle on the face of the waters. And Isaiah spoke of the circle of the earth. And it is a phrase that is often repeated in Scripture. So the corners of the earth is phenomenological language. It envisions the separation between the north and south, the east and the west. Now, I know I threw out this big term, phenomenological language. Let me give you a simple explanation. This time of the year, I think we're all excited about two facts. That the sun is rising earlier in the day, and the sun is setting later in the day. And we have longer days. So we're talking about the sun rising and the sun setting, but we know that this is all the result of orbits. We're not flat earthers, but we speak in terms of our visual perception. So our text speaks of four angels at these four corners, which sets up the real question, what are the four angels doing? Commentator Robert L. Thomas shares this insight. The four winds picture God's destructive action against the earth in prophetic literature. The Jewish concept was that the winds that were blowing from the four quarters, due north, due south, due east, and due west, were favorable, but those blowing from the angles, or the four corners, east, northeast, west, northwest, etc., were harmful. Revelation 7.1 speaks only of unfavorable winds, those that when unleashed will bring harm to the earth. Just a brief aside. Isn't it interesting that it seems whenever we follow destructive storms, what do you hear? Some horrible nor'easter that struck the East Coast. We still see this weather pattern today of how destructive those coming from the angles winds can be. But here's the important thing. What are the angels doing? They're introducing a delay moment in God's judgment. Just before the seventh seal is open, in which there will be tremendous plagues, there is a pause, a parenthesis of sorts. These angels are restraining God's coming judgment. They are, in a sense, with God's blessing, buying time so that God has time to place a protective seal on a group of 144,000 key players in God's redemptive work. Now, as we saw in the text, the 144,000 are described in groups of 12. And on the screen are three different listings of the sons of Jacob and actually two of his grandsons. These are the tribes of Israel. And the first thing that seems very odd is the fact that the tribe of Reuben is not listed first. And there's a reason for that because Reuben slept with a concubine of his father and he dishonored God. And he is removed from the first position. Then also, we see that the tribe of Dan is nowhere listed. And there are two good reasons for this. First, this tribe never stepped out in faith. And therefore, they didn't procure their inheritance. You remember in the book of Joshua, as all of the tribes are given their tribal allotments. It was decided earlier, but now it was time to go and blow. And Dan was told to take on the Canaanites in the northernmost part of Israel, but they didn't want to go there. It was far away. It was dangerous. The Canaanites were well fortified. So instead, they went into one of the other tribes and stole the city of Laish and made that their inheritance. They did not do the job that God had called them to do. And it's one of the reasons, perhaps, that they're not listed. But the second reason is really the big one. The tribe of Dan was the first tribe to introduce idolatry and then continued to promote idolatry for centuries. And if you want to feel for the moral character of this tribe, let's look to their favorite son, Samson. You know, the Samson who had great power that was given to him from God, but so often used it so poorly, like sleeping with prostitutes. The other missing tribe is Ephraim. Now they're there, but they are part of the tribe of Joseph. Joseph had two sons, the grandsons of Jacob, 
are Manasseh and Ephraim. Notice Manasseh is mentioned by name, but Ephraim is not. Instead, they're mentioned by the name of their father, Joseph. Why? Because this also was a deeply idolatrous tribe. So that explains who did and didn't make the cut. But who are these 144,000? First and foremost, they are physical descendants of Abraham. In verse 4, they are called sons of Israel. Remember when God called Jacob and Jacob responded to the call of God, God gave him a new name, Israel, and his descendants are the Israelites. To remove any doubt, their tribal affiliations are listed specifically by name. I almost got tired reading it because everything was from the tribe of, from the tribe of, from the tribe of. That is intentional in the text. The author wants us to see very clearly, John wants us to see clearly that these are the tribes of Israel. Now, another sealed group is found elsewhere in Scripture. Just an interesting aside. In Ezekiel 9.4, a similar protective seal was given to the righteous before Jerusalem was judged by God. But there's this one pesky question. We've talked before about the three Assyrian invasions. This was a judgment of God. And Assyria swept down on three separate occasions and dragged off captives. And their policy was forced resettlement. They took people from here and moved them there, people from there and moved them here. And these groups would all intermarry. Ultimately, the Samaritans are this mongrel group that is the result of these resettlement policies. But we know these tribes as the what? The ten lost tribes. And then there were genealogical records. And we know that in the time of Jesus, there was still knowledge of who came from what tribe. Because remember when Jesus was dedicated at the temple, that he was met by two people, a man named Simeon, who spoke prophetic words concerning this child, Jesus, and then Anna the prophetess of the tribe of Asher. So during Jesus' lifetime, tribal affiliations were still known in Israel. However, when the son of Tiberius Caesar, Titus, came in to Jerusalem, he destroyed the temple, and guess what was inside the temple? All the genealogical records. Quick aside, if somebody comes along now like a Sun Young Moon and claims to be the Messiah, claims to be the Son of God, they cannot authenticate their claim. You see, the Messiah had to come before 70 AD because anyone could say they're a son of David. I could say I'm a son of David. I could say that I'm from the royal line. Part of the family wound up in Norway. What the heck? But in 170 AD comes, nobody can make this claim. Now, who then are these 144,000? And how are their tribal affiliations known if all the records are destroyed? Now, I'm going to go against the grain right now of all the conservative commentators that I read. And I'm going to give you an alternative, albeit biblically conservative, point of view. You see, almost all the commentaries that I read by true conservative scholars asserted that we have no idea of the tribal affiliations of these people, but God must. That this is something that God can know that man would not. Now, personally, I've always had trouble swallowing that argument. Because here's what it suggests. That for generations, tens of generations, Several hundred generations, Asherites have been marrying only Asherites. And Naphtalites only marrying Naphtalites without even knowing it. One of the greatest problems, Nehemiah dealt with this in his day, was intermarriage. That the Jews were intermarrying with foreign and pagan people. But I also want to remind you where I'm from, you know, New York City. I was more familiar with Jewish boys from Brooklyn marrying Catholic girls from Queens. You see, there's been a lot of interfaith marriages. 
We see that in the word of God, but we also see it in our own community. Now, it is true that God can do anything, but years ago, my friend Phil, who was actually in my wedding party, a Hebrew Christian, gave me what I believe is a much better explanation, and I wish that some commentator would pick this thought up. What Phil said to me is, up to this point, the modern state of Israel has never subdivided itself into administrative districts like our 50 states. But someday, as their population grows, they will find the need to do so. And I'll never forget this moment. Phil said, what do you think they might name their states? Is it possible that the Apostle John is not describing bloodlines mystically preserved, but rather describing real place names? This seems much more plausible to me. Now, let me follow up that pesky question with a key historical fact. Israel is a term never specifically applied to the church in the New Testament and never by any Christian until A.D. 160. It is through men like St. Augustine in the 3rd century and the reformers of the 16th century that the plain meaning of the text came to be supplanted by the teaching that the church is the Israel of faith and all of the promises given to the church, uh, given to Israel, have been transferred to the church, leaving Israel out in the cold. I want you to know that all of our pastors in this church see a distinction between Israel and the church. We see that God has a redemptive plan for the Gentile world. Most of us in this room, thank God, came to Christ out of the Gentile world because God had a plan that included us. But also God has a plan to evangelize the Jews. God has not given up on Israel. He never breaks any of his promises, including the very specific promises he gave to Abraham. But let me also say very clearly, the Jews will only be saved through faith in their Messiah, Jesus. There are some Bible teachers like John Hagee who say that the Jews don't need to come to Jesus. They already had a covenant of their own. That is a heretical viewpoint. No one comes to faith except through Christ. There is no other name under heaven by which men may be saved than the name of Jesus. And that is the role of the 144,000. They are Hebrew Christians. They are sealed and motivated Jews for Jesus who will have an impact upon Jews and many Gentiles as well. My brother-in-law had a mom and dad who were Jewish people who came to Christ. I've never seen such evangelistic zeal in my life. The father had actually been a salesman in the garment district in New York. He would go up to anyone and talk. And he'd start talking clothing, but somehow we always wound up with Jesus. There is tremendous zeal for, from Jewish people when they come to know Jesus. And what we are seeing, going to see in these end times is that operating behind enemy lines, these 144,000 will be protected from God's wrath, miraculously, but still subject to the wrath of man. Just as the church has often been shielded, has always been shielded from God's wrath, he will not suffer his own to experience his wrath, but still we are subject to the wrath of man. Which leads to my second of two points. God will abundantly reward the multitude of tribulation martyrs. Now before looking at the second part of our text in Revelation 7, let me take us back for a moment to chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God, for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they were each given a white robe and they were told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete, who were to be killed as they themselves had been. 
So we see this group of martyrs in white robes. They are anxious for God's justice. They are crying out in a loud voice. Now let's jump forward to chapter 7, and we're going to look at verses 9 through 14. Now by this point, several years have passed, and these martyrs have been joined by a greater group of martyrs. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? And I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now, there's no missing that these are the same group. But as I have mentioned, this group has now swelled. An important added detail is apparent. They're not only numerous, but they are multi-ethnic, coming out of the entire four reaches of the world. All tribes, all nations, all languages. This was Jesus' great commission to his church, and it is a mission that we are gaining great progress on right here and now. There was a guy that I met when I was serving South Shore Church in Florida, and he was just kind of stuck. Young man, early 20s. He was working in the computer field. He was feeling that God was calling him to do something more. And after we met together for lunches for about two years, there was this tremendous breakthrough. And Andrew said, I'm going to the mission field. I'm going to use my computer skills to help spread the word of God to unreached people groups. He is doing that today. He now has a wife and a family of several children, and Andrew shared with me that one of the things that they are discovering through all of this computer analysis is that although language was confused at Babel, at one time there was one common speech, and that even when God confused language and created the diversity of languages that we have today, despite all of the apparent differences, they're finding through computer analysis that algorithms can be developed that increase the speed at which we can translate the Word of God into these unknown languages. And the Word of God is spreading like wildfire because more and more people have accurate interpretations of the Word of God, and God has allowed us to use computers to accelerate the process. The Church of Jesus Christ especially over the last several hundred years, has made great inroads. However, this is a process that I believe, from what I see in Scripture, will be completed during the tribulation. We have started our work as the church in fulfilling the Great Commission, but I don't think the work is done until this time and period. You see, the combination of 144,000 Jews for Jesus, Pastor Ryan shared this thought with me last night. He said, I once heard it said this way, don't only think of 144,000 people, imagine 144,000 Apostle Pauls. <laughs> wow! <laughs> so imagine this group and this huge host of Gentile martyrs, and between the two of them they continue the witness of the raptured church. The early church father, Tertullian, once said these words, We multiply whenever we are mown down by you. The blood of Christians is seed. You've heard it in its abbreviated form, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. John tells us that this will continue to be the case during the tribulation. As millions are martyred, believers in Jesus, the tribulation saints, 
will spread the message of Christ like wildfire. So what else do we know about this multitude? Like the group under the altar in chapter 6, they have white robes. These robes are a symbol of purity. But a most important statement is made about how they were bleached. They were made white by the blood of Jesus. Now one of the things that I hate about aging, and there are several, is the fact that your skin gets thin. And I've reached that point now where it seems any project that I do, I succeed in getting some gash. And because the skin is thin, there's not a whole lot of pain. And I've been known to drip blood through the kitchen, to stain my clothes. And Cindy is like, how did you cut yourself? Aren't you going to do something about that? Well, if there's anything that I've learned, it's that when I do that, I cause her great work. Because if there's anything we know about blood, it stains and it doesn't come out. Well, the blood of these martyrs' robes has not been made white by bleach. It has not been made white by oxyclean, but it is the ultimate conundrum. Although blood stains, there is a blood that removes the stain of sin, the blood of Jesus, the blood that he shed for you. And here's now our Palm Sunday moment. These martyrs are carrying palm branches. Now for the ancient Jews, as well as for the Greeks and the Romans and the Egyptians, palm branches were significant. They were symbols of victory. Remember the old biblical epic, epic movies? And you'll see some Olympic athlete or some victorious general, and he is presented with a crown of laurel. That leafy crown was a symbol of victory. Palm branches in the, this part of the ancient world had the same meaning. It's a symbol of victory. The palm branches indicated an overcomer. Now, another key detail about this multitude from many different nationalities, they are worshiping in heaven's throne room. They're standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They're in the presence of the 24 elders and those freaky living creatures that continually praise God. When I hear descriptions of them with the eyes all around their heads, it's like, no, I don't need to see that picture. But someday we'll see it with different eyes. But let me put it this way. This huge army of martyrs has a front row seat in heaven. The Antichrist basket of deplorables are now honored above all others because of their courage and their unwavering commitment. And we learn one more key fact. <coughs> they have come out of the Great Tribulation. Now, in light of all I've already said, this seems like an obvious statement. But don't miss the emotion attached to this. They who were hunted down and tortured and killed for their faith have come out now on the other side. Satan's most savage tool is suffering and death. But remember Jesus told us not to fear the one who could merely kill the body? And our text ends with the rewards of these martyrs. Look with me in chapter 7, 15 through 17. Therefore they are before the throne of God, and they serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. As we look at this list of rewards, I can't miss how they stand in stark contrast to the conditions that these martyrs endured during the closing years of their lives. I want you to picture something with me, and it's an uncomfortable ask. Picture for a moment the Jewish settlers in Kibbutz Be'eri in the southwestern part of Israel. Picture from just what you've heard on the news what they endured at the hands of Hamas. We shudder, don't we? Our minds don't want to go there. Now imagine something equally, if not more savage, 
But instead of taking place over several hours, it lasts for three and a half years, and the three and a half preceding years were no picnic either. Add to that the many plagues that we read about in the book of Je Revelation, those horrors that we, the church, were spared from, but that they will endure. You see, the moment these tribulation saints threw their lot in with Jesus, their lives went from horrible to ghastly. So imagine what it means for them to be sheltered in God's presence. You've watched some of the video footage that we've seen on the news of those people who were held by Hamas, not just for hours, but for months, and were then released, and the joy that they felt when they came into the protective borders of their own nation. Imagine, here are these martyrs, and they are now in the safest place in the universe, God's throne room. Imagine what it means for them, who are on the run, who are lacking provisions to have no more hunger, to have no more thirst, and in their place to have the springs of living water like Jesus promised to the Samaritan woman, a spring of water that would spring up forever, referring to the gift of eternal life. Their shepherd is the good shepherd who gently wipes away the tears of their past so that their many sufferings are not carried forward into eternity. Let me put it this way. In heaven there will be no PTSD. Despite the great horrors that these martyrs have suffered, they will enter into heaven and be made entirely whole. Tears will be dried away forever. So we've spent this Palm Sunday looking towards a future day where believers in Jesus who are martyred for their faith will wave palm branches and praise God the God of heaven who delivered them victorious. So as we close, let me just draw out three takeaway lessons for us, the church. Number one, there will never be a time where Satan is not restrained. Now that may rub against the grain of what you've heard, but consider this profound statement by commentator Ed Hinson. The Holy Spirit is not removed from the world at the rapture event as some have taught. It is his ministry of restraining sin that is removed. But the omnipresent spirit is present on the earth, saving millions of people. The Holy Spirit has an essential role in our salvation. How could the tribulations be saved if the Holy Spirit was completely absent? You see, the great tribulation will be a time of great suffering, but it will also be a season where belief in Jesus will spread like never before, because the blood of martyrs is seed. Number two, not even death can separate Jesus and his people. Now this promise was given to us, the church, through the Apostle Paul. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, this word is for us, but it was actually also has been written for the future, for the tribulation saints, because they are part of those things to come. God has not changed. Neither the death of Christian martyrs during the church age or the death of future martyrs in the great tribulation, none of them will be lost because Jesus never misplaces his own. Number three, when he returns, Jesus will rule. The kingdom will be in our midst, but also the king will be on the throne. As you watch the evening news, and if you're at all wired like me, as you fight the temptation to throw something at the screen and scream, I want you to, it's practical here, pause, count to ten. And I want you to remember, where is Jesus right now? He is in heaven. He is seated on the throne. At the right hand of his Father, already exercising ruling authority in heaven, and Jesus is coming back.
Amen. Amen. He's coming back. Justice is coming. We long for this, right? No matter how long you've been alive on this earth, I guarantee since you came to Jesus, you have been longing for justice on the earth. I just want you to know justice is coming. Righteous rule will be here someday. I hope someday soon. And during Jesus' millennial thousand-year reign, we, the church, will have joy-filled work to do in the administration of our king. You notice how all the politicos on both sides of the aisle are wondering whether they should leave their elective offices in the Senate, in the House, in order to be a part of the next administration. And they're both sure they're going to win. Brothers and sisters, we have a guaranteed place. If you have accepted Jesus in your heart and have faith in him, we have a guaranteed role in the greatest administration that will ever rule. So I want to just encourage you, don't put your trust in political messiahs. That was the key mistake during the Palm Sunday event, right? Jesus regale, was regaled as king, and this huge crowd was celebrating him, but they had expectations. They expected that he would rule right away, that he would overthrow Rome. And when he didn't meet those expectations, when he said, the kingdom is your midst, but my rule is not yet, they wanted nothing to do with him because what they wanted was a political messiah. That was a mistake in the first century. It is a mistake in the 21st century. And I hear this all the time. If this one is elected president, America is doomed. If that one is elected president, America is saved. There is only one person who can save America. There is only one person who can save this fallen world. And what's his name? Jesus. Jesus. Don't trust in political messiahs. Trust in the Son of God. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you this Palm Sunday, and it is so amazing to think that not only were palm branches raised as you entered in Jerusalem, but that someday in heaven, a whole army of martyrs will wave palms before you. And there's no period on this. There's no end point. Throughout all eternity, people will cry out, Hosanna, Hosanna. Throughout all eternity, palms will be raised in your presence. Throughout all eternity, you will be worshipped as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And we, your people, as we have worshipped you today and held palms in our hands, we, your people, also praise the one who is righteous and altogether true. Amen. Thanks again for listening to this message. We would love to hear from you and learn how God may have challenged you or blessed you as you listen to this message, especially if you feel that you are ready to take your next steps in your walk with Jesus. So contact our church at any time. We would love to hear from you, and we look forward to connecting with you. But in the meantime, God bless.